Okay. Um, yeah, then we are starting with the, um, actually the last um, uh, segment of this conference on regulatory fra frameworks. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Barry Prentice for the possibility to moderate this session. Thank you very much. Um, for the others uh, that I um, did not see before, my name is Frank Newman. Um, I'm director of the Institute for Infrastructure, Environment and Innovation. And um, yeah, it sort of triggered me in the beginning to hear uh, the sound uh, from uh, Mr. Mike Durham that uh, more cooperation is uh, necessary and collaborative approach. That's exactly the uh, also the angle um, that the Institute for Infrastructure Environment takes on. We established a collaborative platform, uh, ULTA, particularly tuned to exercises that are focused on upscaling. And it's not only that we want to um, develop collaborative projects, uh, but also um, that we want to attract supplies in supply industries like developers of um, envelopes or a cheaper way of testing and burst test for gas bags, uh, expertise centers who are only doing that. Uh, and then for a, a better budget, then of course, when it would be just individual developers, um, each time making a separate deal. So um, the purpose of this platform is to um, encourage uh, collaborative products and to find funding for it. Um, and yes, uh, now, uh, in fact, one of our other um, activities also, we're organizing a meeting very soon in Africa um, and the applications uh, for uh, light and air technology, which will be in one June. Um, but I will not want to say too much about that. Um, I think uh, because of the reasons of time. So um, I would like to give then the floor then to um, Thibaut Prue uh, from uh, Flying Wheels. And um, yes, uh, Thibaut has an extensive experience, more than eight years with Flying Wheels, has been starting as a, 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 a design engineer and now particularly uh, specializing on um, uh, safety um and uh, regulatory aspects uh, yeah so tibu uh, please uh, take the floor uh, welcome to this uh, conference okay thank you uh, frank okay so uh, yeah thank you for this introduction thank you uh, barry for uh, organizing this event for i don't know how many times you organized such conference and uh, uh fortunately we have to do it online this time and i can't wait to meet you all uh again i've seen a lot of participants and a lot of well-known names who are Hi to everyone that uh, I knew. Uh, so yes, we, we're going to focus on, on certification for airships uh, today. So my name is Thibaut Fuchs. I'm working from Flying Wild since 2013. And yeah, my main focus was about this huge challenge uh, for Flying Wilds and for any airship manufacturers, which is about how do we have to make it certified? How can we make it certified such huge machines? Um, <clears throat> so I will just uh, split my presentation in two parts. One will be on what does exist today in terms of certification for airships? What does it mean actually to certify such machine? And what are the, let's say, the, the, the wide range of activities that has to be performed to, to certify this machine and make it fly again uh, in terms of regulations? And then I will spend more time on, on uh, European initiative uh, that actually Mike already presented a little bit. I will go deeper on this. And I will show you that we have made a lot of progress on, on, on these regulatory frameworks uh, and that this should be and, and is uh, actually beneficial for, for all the uh, industry, airship industry. Um, yeah, so my main message actually is to, to show you what we have done so far and to show that this can be used and should be used uh, abroad uh, the European borders. So what is certification? Um, usually when we think about certification, we always think about the administrative burden associated with it, like it's uh, just a lot of regulations we have to comply with. It's quite unclear what we have to comply with. We don't even understand why we have to comply with such requirements. Sometimes it makes no sense. It's too prescriptive on our design. It's limiting the innovations, all these kind of ideas. Well, you have to understand that certification is just the best and only way to make sure that you will be allowed to make this machine fly and operated and uh, make it a, a commercial product. But why do we have to certify that such machines and everything around? Well, it's because we just need to make sure that our products are safe. That's the basic principle. We don't want to kill anyone with this machine, with these products. We are making flying, flying machines that can endanger people that are inside the machines itself, but also that are on the ground. 
So we have to make sure that our product is safe. And um, well, in our airship industry, we have some kind of background events with that. Uh, I put here the, the Hindenburg accident that everyone knows well about. And as you can see, there were a lot of, let's say, it was, it was the, the, the first buzzing event at this time. Uh, this event went worldwide. Uh, and it, actually it didn't kill entirely the airship world, but it at least impact significantly the, the, this industry. Because even today, uh, I can speak for flying water, but I think it was the same for, it's the same for everyone here. When we are trying to uh, attract investors, uh, attract talent, people to join the, the company, or partners, technical partners, or even political, political people, they all have this idea of airships being unsafe. And because they have this idea of Hindemo that was like more than 80 years ago. Um, so just to say that this event that went quite viral at this time, uh, impact significantly the society that still today have this image that airships are unsafe. And so the level of constraints in terms of certification can be super high. And why so? Because actually certification is entirely linked with safety. Uh, the, 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 the more the society is expecting to have a high level of safety, the more the certification will be constraining. So I put here the example that is actually extracting from the FAA website. Well, you can see that uh, a small small UAV, unmanned air vehicle, uh, has a low level of, of constraints in, in terms of certification because the society can accept a higher level of risk because it's small, because you have no one side, because when it crash, the inertia uh, at the impact is quite low. So we can accept to lose such machine, let's say at a, um, uh, let's say a lot, uh, not every day, but on, on a quite frequent uh, basis. Well, on the other side, uh, a huge airplane transporting 200, 300 persons uh, flying at uh, 13,000 uh, feet above the ground at uh, 900 kilometers per hour. We don't want these airplanes to go down every day. We don't want them to kill everyone uh, every day, to crash on cities and so on. So the, le the level of safety except, uh, expected by the society is quite high. And then the level of constraint in terms of certification is quite high too. So for airships, we, we have to go into the same direction. We have to find way where we have to uh, position ourselves in this uh, in this scale. What is the proper level of safety we should uh, put in place? We should um, ask for airships to comply with. And then what is the proper level of certification we have to uh, comply with and make the demonstration? So that's, yeah, that was the, the, the first idea. Um, then when we want to go deeper into what is certification, certification is not just certifying a product. Okay, so the type certificate is one thing, but actually you have a lot of other things that you have to make certified. I put here in my slide some different uh, approvals that any companies that are developing, producing, operating, maintaining airships or airplanes uh, has to comply with. Um, so a lot of approvals that they, were, they have to get. Um, actually certification is for yeah, any, time of, any type of entities that are part of uh, building up this machine, making, making it fly, operating it, maintaining it. So you have to certify the product, you have to certify the company that is designing the product, the company that is producing the product, the company that is operating the product, even the company that is uh, licensing the maintenance personnel. So you have to have a lot of approvals. Again, this can be seen as a huge administrative burden, but it's a useful one because this is the only way to make sure that we'll make no mistakes, and at the end of the day, we will develop and operate a safe product. Uh, you have, I think you know, all know that you have to, uh, uh, to, to, to work with uh, several um, civil aviation authorities, regulators. So we have ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Authorities Organizations, that is an entity from uh, the UN located in, in Montreal. But you also have in each country a civil aviation authority. So in Europe, we have IASA. In Canada, uh, you have TCCA, USA have, uh, have the FAA. And so you have to make the demonstrations uh, to these authorities. So to make sure that you are developing a, a safe product. The basic problem that we all face in the airship world is, well, we don't have regulations for airships. Regulations has been built up and uh, uh, iterated for um, heavier than air vehicles. You have for airplanes, you have for autocrafts, but you don't have, or you have really little regulations adapted to airships. So it is problematic when you are operating an airship. You can ask for the operators uh, to Zeppelin, for instance, 
how do they train their ship pilots? Which what kind of licensing like licensing do they do they have? Uh, how do they maintain their ship? Uh, how do they license and train their maintenance crew? Um, and we have some problematic uh, for the certification itself uh, to certify the, the airship itself. What are the certification requirements my airship should demonstrate the compliance with? And so facing this issue uh, in flying wells, we have been working for many years on these aspects. Uh, so on these two main uh, aspects, um, I will talk about uh, first about the, the PAP certification of the airship itself. So as I told you, uh, when you want to certify a product, well, you have to demonstrate compliance with set of certification requirements. Okay, that has been, again, built up by uh, several decades of experience. Problem is, for airships, we don't have this experience, or we had in the past, and sometimes we lost it. As you can see in my, on my screen, there were actually a lot of certification requirements that has been built uh, in the recent decades, uh, in the past decades. Um, and if you look at it quite deeply, it's quite correlated with uh, an airship that has been developed at the same time. Um, so these codes are quite design prescriptive, quite oriented on these designs. Uh, and again, if you look at uh, what is today certified on an airship, you don't have so much. You have the Zeppelin uh, NG that is uh, certified, actually the only one certified in Europe and in USA, uh, and few others uh, airships like in uh, certified in FAA on, on UK or, uh, or, or in Brazil also. Um, and as you can see, there are not so much airships certified. And the, the problem that we faced in flying was many years ago when we start building up this machine is uh, what kind of regulations should we take to certify the machine? At this time, uh, my dev, head of design organization uh, and CTO asked me, okay, Chico, what are the set of requirements I have to comply with? And I look at the existing code and I say, okay, CS30T or TAR, transporter ship requirements that was built for the cargo lifter project uh, more than 20 years ago is what is making the most of sense for us. So I pushed the code to him and to his team. And a few months later, he came back to me saying, yeah, well, this is so complex to comply with. This is not adapted to what we wanna do. It's too design prescriptive. It doesn't capture the uh, design specificities and operational specificities of our airship. Um, and we don't really understand where the history of this or these requirements. And when I look deep into this code, what was bothering me a lot is the safety objective that was supposed to be covered by this code was not really the one that we identified. So we were missing, missing the real target of what is a certification code, which is to cover safety objectives. Um, so we had this issue. Okay, CS30T was partially applicable. I put you the, the schematic of, of our analysis at this time. Uh, so most of, yeah, let's say 50% of it was uh, applicable, but 50% was not understandable, uh, was to be deeply uh, investigated and to be modified or to be questioned. So it was quite complex to comply with this code. And then we came up with this idea, discussing with IASA and with other projects that we could have another approach uh, to have some kind of high level code that is safety oriented, that is operation based, uh, that is just dividing, uh, defining just what are the basic safety uh, objectives that we wanna cover with, with, with certification for this type of airships. Um, and, um, and yes, this is what we, what we came up uh, at this time. And then we had this important discussion with IASA and with hybrid vehicles, Zeppelin, WDL. And as uh, Mike presented earlier in 20, I think it was 2018, November 2018, where we came out with this issue. And we together decided to build up this group named Airship Manufacturers and Operators, uh, where we built up two task force. One was especially on the uh, certification codes to have an harmonized code with the plane, with hybrid air vehicles, with flying wells, which we all have quite different type of airships, okay? Passengers, uh, cargo, uh, hybrid, uh, pure equilibrium, uh, rigid, blimp, or semi-rigid. Uh, very, very, a lot of different type of, of operations and design features. And we, want, we wanted to have an harmonized code. So it's quite difficult approach huh, to, to, to converge these the certification codes. And then the second task force that was really uh, to focus on the rules for operations. Oh, uh, so about the air operations, the flight time limitations, the flight crew licensing, and so on. So since 2018, we've been working together 
uh, in, a, in a partnership, in cooperations, uh, to build up these this regulations. And so on, on, on the uh, certification code itself, I will not go into all the details, but let's say that we follow an approach that has been built up by IASA uh, around 2017 uh, on CS25 and 5 which is for general aviation and on the VTOL, you know, the vertical takeoff and landing types of vehicles. So we follow the same approach. We look into all the existing regulations for airships and we try to cover what is the essence of, of um, safety for airships. And we push the code uh, with everyday vehicles. We push the code to IASA around end of 2020. Uh, it was a long process uh, since 2018 to, to reach this uh, harmonized code with, with everyday vehicles. And then we push it to IASA that went to an internal process and then went to public consultation. And then finally that iterated the code up to a final publication uh, beginning of this year. So as you can see, it was many years of activities uh, with Ibrida Vehicles and IASA to come up to this special condition for gas airships, uh, which is quite basic. It's like 30 pages, one of the requirements, let's say. And when you look at it, you're like, yeah, well, okay, that's obvious. We have to, okay, if you want to, to fly your airship in lightning conditions, you have to protect against lightning. It makes good sense, a lot of sense. Nonetheless, it defines the proper safety, uh, safety objective for, for, for airships. And this is the first time that IASA is publishing officially a certification code for, for airships. Um, just one point here also, just to, to let you know, the amount of effort that we have to put in place, that we had to put in place for, for reaching this, this certification code. Uh, my team is composed of four people. Uh, we have spent, I think, maybe 50% of our time building up the SC gas for the last three years. Uh, non and I didn't count in here all the uh, designers and, and CVs that work with us to, to converge on this code. So it's a consistent effort for flying wells, um, just for 30 pages codes, but that is actually uh, making our life way easier. So I will just go a little bit deeper in the ESC gas that has been published by, by IASA. Uh, so it's a code that is allowing you to design an airship and certify an airship that is using all type of lifting gas. So you can use hydrogen, uh, helium or hydrogen, okay? And, and you don't have a strict requirement saying usage of hydrogen gas lifting gas is banned. This is not what you can find in SC gas. You will find something different that will allow you to use hydrogen, but you have obviously to make the demonstration that it's a safe usage, okay? Um, I don't spoke about hot air ashes because there is already a, a sufficient spec for, for that. Uh, but it's also a code that is allowing you to develop and certify any kind of airship structure. So if you want to do a purely rigid, like flying wires, a semi-rigid, like uh, a Zeppelin NT, a pressured airship, a metal clad, whatever you want in terms of structure, you, you can use the SC gas. Uh, same goes for the uh, lift capacity. Are you using a pure equilibrium airship or a hybrid type of airship? Well, you will see some requirements that are specific to each type of, of uh, airship lift. Um, it also covers almost all type of, of propulsion systems. For instance, in flying wells, we have a quite specific hybrid electric uh, um, propulsion system. Uh, I, I, I quite doubt that we can uh, use only SC gas to integrate fuel cells uh, yet. Uh, I, I, and something that we had in mind for a long time, I think we'll have to, it's, it's quite innovative. So we'll have maybe to, to use other type of of a certification spec or, or special conditions that are ongoing on, on the other world if you want to integrate such technology. Uh, and it's also a code that is allowing you to do all types of operations, uh, passengers, cargo, surveillance, tourism, whatever you want. The, co the code is, is not prescriptive for that, so you can use it uh, also. Um, so as I told you, if you want to do some specific things that we didn't include it in the SIG as like unmanned airships, high altitude or uh, specific propulsion systems, um, SC gas is a good basis, but you will have to club uh, other type of requirements uh, to make sure you cover these, these specific aspects. Then on the other side, the second working group that we have been deeply involved in with uh, HAV and Zeppelin is about what he has called the best intervention strategy. It's an internal formal um, process uh, of, of IASA, where uh, again, since many years now, we have built up uh, a proposal to IASA on a set of rules uh, for uh, airships operations. So what is about the flight time limitation? Uh, because when you want to fly an airship that is supposed to fly for many days, for several days in a row, well, the flight time limitation for the crew 
is critical. And it's a, a critical topic that you have to, to, to tackle and that you have to uh, find solutions on. Uh, because if you just stick to what is existing, well, you cannot make it that simple. Uh, the air operator certificates also is a tricky thing that we have looked into. The flight crew licensing, again, uh, you don't have commercial pilot licensing for airships, for instance. So how do you want, uh, how can you uh, certify uh, flight crews to operate your airships? And as I think, I don't know who said today earlier today that uh, they will have to, uh, set to, to license uh, maybe hundreds of, of uh, pilots. The same for us. Uh, I think Arnaud showed you earlier that we are targeting a market of 150 airships worldwide in the next 10 years. Uh, so it's a lot of pilots that we have to train and to license. The continuing effort, I also it's, it's a huge topic that we have to, to tackle. So um, on one side, the SC gas is already published. And the next steps on the SC gas are to work on the means of compliance Maybe it will be published one day. Here, uh, we are in the middle of the process uh, with these uh, airship rules. Uh, a first consultation already occurred last, uh, last year with EASA. We are in the second consultation phase now. And while well, the next steps are to integrate the proposals that we reach with, F, uh, with HAV and Zeppelin into what is called rulemaking tasks, specific tasks actually, that will investigate the proposals and that at the end of the day will build up the new regulations. Then we'll have to go for notice for proposed amendments and one day opinion for uh, to the EU Commission. So here we are in a, in a multi-year process. And that's why we started super early for our project because even if we are not operating the airship uh, in two years from now, but maybe in four or five years, well, we have to tackle it today. And as you can see, it's again, a huge effort, a huge, uh, we put a lot of resources on, on, on this aspect to make sure that we'll have the proper uh, rules ready on time. Yeah, so just uh, one more details on the uh, airship BIS, B, uh, best intervention strategy. Again, four main focus, one on the air operation rules uh, for the uh, personnel, the air operator certificates and so on. The flight time limitation, uh, when you want to fly many hours or many days in a row, the continuing airworthiness licensing, and the flight crew licensing that has been even discussed at ICAO level. Uh, because again, all these rules are non existing today for airships. If you want to adapt what is existing, it's already quite a huge challenge. Uh, but we have no choice. No, 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 choice, no choice. We have to adapt what is existing. Sometimes we have to build up new regulations, and it's a really long process. That's why we anticipated uh, many years ago. So as a conclusion, well, again, we spend significant time on your, on, on your European side with uh, HAV and Zeppelin and WDL to build up the regulatory frameworks in terms of tax certification, in terms of air operations, uh, to make sure that we'll be able to certify these machines, to certify the operations, and at the end of the day, uh, that are paving the road to the next generation of airships, next, next programs, but also the next generation of airships. So, we have done it on our side. Uh, we spend a lot of time with that, uh, on that, a lot of effort. Um, we are progressing quite well. We have some good achievements already with the SCGAS publication, with uh, the BIS uh, first steps that uh, went quite well also. Uh, we are still in the, pro in the process of continuing this, uh, uh, this, pro this, uh, this progress. Um, my point is, um, we again spend a lot of time on this and this can be beneficial for everyone. It should be, actually. Uh, it can be useful for a lot of other uh, type of uh, airships products, for a lot of other type of operations. And at the end of the day, this is, in my opinion, what uh, is the best way to ensure that this industry will develop itself. Uh, so again, these initiatives can and should be extended out of European borders. Um, it will ease the mutual recognition and validations of our type certificates, of our uh, operations, and so on. And again, uh, it's, uh, it's beneficial for everyone. So I hope that uh, we will be able to talk about it more uh, in details uh, in a few months when we we'll, uh, meet together, uh, all together in, in Canada. I can't wait for that, for, frankly. I, I would love to, to meet you again. Um, yes, and that's it for me. I hope that you enjoy this presentation. If you have uh, any more questions, uh, please let me know. Don't hesitate to contact me also if you have more questions on the uh, certification and regulatory frameworks that we have been working on. Uh, we are still in flying wells on the path of getting the type certificate, uh, target date today is 2025, 2026. Um, we are uh, working with IASA and Transport Canada. Uh, so it's a, 
long process, but we are on, on the good path for that. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy my presentation and uh, give you the mic, uh, uh, Barry and Frank. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Thibault. It was an excellent uh, presentation, a very good overview, also a good description of the part of the process, of course, the type certificate process. Um, a couple of questions, actually. I think the first you may have already been answering, um, that was if Transport Canada was involved during the process. Um, that seems to be the case. Um, and then there are two other questions, particularly focusing on the, um, the, the, the EASA, uh, the, the, or one question, actually nearly two, on the EASA trajectory from Johannes Ising. Um, what are the consequences of abandoning the balloon mode? And that's a little bit a point I know in this, um, um, this SC gas bag discussion. Uh, the uh, near, liquor, uh, near equilibrium requirement. Do you see this question? It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't see the question, but I get the point. Uh, so first of all, about the uh, Canadian aspect. So um, so I think I'll show you a, a little bit earlier, but at the beginning of the program, uh, Canada was not part of the, of the program at the beginning, very beginning. So we targeted the ESA certification only. Um, then since 2019, uh, Canadian and actually Quebec government uh, under the shareholding structure. So, and this is when we discover that there are a lot of interesting markets for, for flying wells in Canada also. So we decided to investigate deeply the what we call concurrent certification. And actually it's quite recent. I think we have some TCC representative here that we, uh, that I talked with like few, few, few weeks ago at IASA. Uh, so yeah, flying wells is targeting a concurrent certification with Transport Canada and IASA. We are just starting the process. So. Uh, we are just in just starting it. Then about the uh, question from Johannes about the free balloon mode. Actually, actually, it's not. Uh, it's part of the SC gas. Uh, I, I I noted this uh, this comment. I don't know when where uh, Johannes asked me about it already, but uh, actually, it's part of of the certification code of the SC gas. Uh, it's it's a high level code, so it's it's quite interpret interpretative, and that's obviously the objective. Uh, but as far I can tell you, flying wells uh, LCS60T is targeting a free balloon mode that is categorized as hazardous, not catastrophic. So uh, it's something that we have in mind. And uh, SC gas is allowing the free balloon mode. IASA is quite open on this idea also. So yeah, I, I can I, I can send you the, the, the exact uh, requirements that is pointing on the, the uh, free balloon mode uh, if you want. Yeah, and then Sven asked about the airworthiness uh, certification. Of course, that's a step further, um, but that's something which you have not worked on um, to great intensity, I think, so far, right? Because yeah, you need, first need to have the carrier, of course. I, I didn't get your question. Uh, well, after the type certificate, of course, if you want to fly, you later need the airworthiness certificate. Um, and I think there is yes. one. Yeah, Sven is asking about that. Yeah, yeah. So certificate of airworthiness is something that we can uh, uh, later on. Uh, again, on our process today, we are still at, not at the beginning because it's been like more than eight years that I've been joining the company. Um, but uh, no, no, we find the, the, what we call the COFA is a certificate of airworthiness is something that will launch uh, at, the, at the end of the, of the certification. Yeah, <clears throat> and then there are some questions being asked about the. Mm, the lengthy process, which is of course uh, uh, quite common for this kind of complicated certifications and how you fund it. Uh, yeah. But I guess, yeah, just pain, which you have to go through, right? Because you want to put something in the air, yes, you're obliged to take these steps. So there's not much to do about that, actually. Yeah, yeah so certification is obviously um, a huge constraint uh, when you are developing a new flying machine, but you have no choice again. Uh, when you are talking about what is the uh, effort that a company should put on certification? Um, some will say that it's between, let's say, 30 to 50% of your engineering time. Uh, that's, that is huge, obviously, on, on the overall cost of a program. Well, um, what, can what, what I can tell you is our certification team is composed of more than, well, it's, today it's, it's five, pe five people full time. So, yes, it's a huge cost. It's engineer, so it's quite expensive too. Uh, and, and but yeah, that's that's the way you make it certified at the end of the day. So uh, no, no real choice uh, here. And then there was a, another question, um, and the last question, and this was about uh, the unmanned um, airship. How that is discussed, but I think you answered that already in your presentation by saying that um, uh, part of it could be also applied to unmanned. And the question was actually. 
where they are considered as drones in, by the EASA. Um, I think that is the case, actually, because there is a special drone regulation. The drone regulation doesn't say mm -hmm. if it's a light and air or not. It doesn't give any description for that. Uh, yeah, but, so um, yeah. This, 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 this specific type of, of aircraft, actually, it's a combination of of, uh, of of what is existing, so that's why at all uh, for, for the uh, unmanned parts, you can use you can use uh, specific special conditions that has been built, and you can club together the specificities of AC gas with these codes. Same goes for the fuel cells or, or this kind of innovation. You can club together to have a, a good certification code at the end of the day. Yes. Okay, and I think then we dealt with most of the question. There is one rolling in still. That is already being discussed, the unmanned one. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, as chair, I'm not shouldn't ask questions, but very curious. So, um, to what extent, um, very short question, to what extent you all already also was um, uh, are looking at the air services regulation? So, because you are also uh, planned to be use your airship in Europe, uh, what about the yeah. air service regulation? Did you already think of that, or let's maybe already? Still a little bit too early because it's about the pricing of your services in the end. Uh, yeah. I didn't get your point. Uh, I didn't get your, your question actually. Yeah, uh, the air services regulation uh, within the European Union arranged, then how pricing is arranged for services to transport goods uh, over the air by the air. Uh, yeah. And yeah, that is uh, not, not about safety, but it's more about price setting and how you um, make customers pay for your services. Um, did you already look into that or not yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, again, um, fine. Today, Flame Wells is uh, developing an airship uh, product and, and we'll make it certified. So we are already starting to produce it. Uh, tomorrow, Flame Wells will be also an operator. So we are working, fine, we are building up a company named Flame Wells Services that will operate the airship and sell flight hours to customers. Uh, so obviously, uh, costs and, and, and for all costs in terms of operations are taken into consideration in the design of the machine itself. Uh, so I will not spend all the details, obviously, um, but it's something that we have in mind since the very beginning. And in terms of regulations, it's also something that has an impact. When you want to uh, operate your, your machine out of Europe, even in Europe, you have to take a lot of regulations that we are dealing with. You know, when you want to operate it uh, uh, out of Europe, if you want to cross borders, if you want to do uh, transport goods from one country to another, it's quite complex. If you want to transport dangerous goods, it's also another regulation. So this is something that we have in mind that we are investigating and that we are tackling when we identify some uh, uh, potential gaps that we have to uh, uh, work on. Thank you very much.